Professor Gacheni, welcome to the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Um, today, today we want to discuss about your book, uh, Epistemic Freedom in Africa, uh, Deprovincialization and, and Decolonization. But uh, uh, before we, we, we get to discuss the book, I, I just want to uh, have a discussion with you about your academic career. Um, yeah. Can you just uh, briefly take us through your academic journey from your undergraduate years up until the time you became a full professor? Okay, and that's a that that that's 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 a lifetime story. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. But, uh, uh, I I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Zimbabwe. Okay, uh, I joined uh, the university in 1990, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I studied uh, uh, economic history, history, and the Eastern Devil. Uh, then in the second year, that's when I was uh, honored to be given the opportunity to do an honors degree in history. Mm -hmm. So I did a, a three-year degree and I qualified with an honors degree in 1992 in, in history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I did my master's again at the University of Zimbabwe in uh, 1994 and uh, 1995. Uh, an, an MA in African history with a specialization in race class and ethnicity, oral tradition in African history, mm -hmm. the military history of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I did my PhD again at the same university. <laughs> oh, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. That's great. That's uh, great. Supervised by very great historians, uh, Professor Ngwami Pepe and uh, Professor Terence Ranger. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked on the the historical dimensions of democracy and human rights in a pre-colonial society with the case study of the Ndebele state from 1818 to 1934. Uh, so basically that's, that's, that's my journey. And uh, uh, <clears throat> in terms of employment, I became a teaching assistant at the University of Zimbabwe from uh, 1995 to 1999. And then in 2000, I joined the newly established Midland State University as a lecturer in the Department of uh, History and Development Studies. And I was there from, <coughs> from uh, 2000 to 2004. And uh, it was in 2005 that I moved to South Africa. Mm. And I taught at uh, Monash University, where I joined the Department of uh, uh, international studies, and I was at Monash University for three years, uh, from 2005 to 2007. Then I moved to the Ferguson Center for African and Asian Studies uh, at the Open University in Milton Keynes in the UK, where I was lecturer for African studies. Uh, and then I came back to South Africa in 2010, and I joined the South African Institute for International Affairs as a senior researcher in a program on South African foreign policy and African drivers. Uh, uh, then in 2011, that's when I moved to the University of South Africa. I've been at the University of South Africa for nine years uh, until I moved now to, to University of Bayreuth uh, in Germany as a professor and the and and chair of uh, epistemologies of the global south with emphasis on Africa. But I must say that uh, my first professorship was actually given by the University of South Africa in 2012, and it is a professorship in development studies. Mm. Oh, oh, that's, that's, that's quite, a, quite a profound journey for you. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I, I believe that uh, you, you, your experience uh, and uh, your academic journey will inspire so many lots of uh, generations and so many uh, students who wish to be professional historians, who wish to be professional researchers uh, yes. and academics at these established universities. Yes. I've been going through some reviews of your book uh, and I've noticed that uh, it received quite some impressive reviews and lofty praise from the academic community. Yeah. I, I read one of the reviews by Toyin Falola yeah. who is a Nigerian professor of African studies at the University of 
uh, Texas at Austin. And yeah. he, described, he described this book as the most serious and radical indictments of both colonialism and post-colonialism. Yeah. A work of good sense and judgment, a sophisticated analysis of the ep epistemology of the South, and a landmark text in the fields of coloniality and post-coloniality. I, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure this was profound and this was so exciting to receive. Of course, uh, from, uh, from Toyin Falola, really a doyen of African history and African studies, it was, it was indeed uh, a, a gift to, to, to get that endorsement. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Um, so can, can you give us a brief synopsis of, yeah. of your book and its central argument? Yeah, the book as the title uh, actually reveals, it addresses what is known as the epistemic question in, uh, in Africa. In other words, uh, it's a book about knowledge. Uh, it's a book about uh, the politics of knowledge in Africa. And uh, it is very specific why it is focused on Africa, because uh, it's, a, it's a continent inhabited by a people <clears throat> whose very being has been questioned. And they immediately you question the being human of a people. Fundamentally, you also question their ability to produce knowledge, their ability to possess knowledge. So this book is one of those which underscores the central argument that all human beings are born into valid and legitimate knowledge systems. And they, it therefore means that as African people, if we are indeed people, it means therefore we have our own knowledge systems, which uh, colonialism uh, tried to destroy for its own purposes of uh, inscribing a European memory and a European knowledge. So it's a book which uh, <clears throat> covers a, a va various aspects of this fundamental question of, uh, of epistemology, of knowledge, particularly linking the question of epistemic freedom with uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, from the basis of uh, uh, the color line. The color line is as, as, as depicted by a W.E.B. Du Bois long, long ago, whereby the color line then puts some people into the zone of being and they put other people into the zone of non-being. And those who are in the zone of non-being are therefore deprived of the epistemic virtue and the ability to know. Uh, and this book actually challenges that type of coloniality of knowledge in which there are people without history, people without knowledge, people without alphabet, people without civilization, people without development, people without human rights, people without ethics. So it challenges a, an array of issues in the, in the, and it challenges really the imperial reason and the imperial thought. <clears throat> oh, okay, I see. Uh, so what are, what are some of the examples that you use to justify the arguments that you raise? Of course, uh, one of the key uh, opening parts of the book, it actually comes from my, my primary field of research, which is African history, whereby I pose the question, how African is African history? Mm -hmm. uh, and that question is a, is a long-standing perennial question, uh, whereby perhaps by the time African history was, <clears throat> was accepted as a, as a legitimate academic endeavor, it means it was already colonized by the thematics of European history. So the issue of whether there's, there's something called the African idea of history and the African philosophy of history is still haunting us as historians. So that, I used that as a, as a departure point for this book to say up to now, we'll need really to deal with that question, whether what we write as African history, is it really African history? Or it is colonized methodologically, it is colonized thematically, it is colonized epistemologically. Wow, that's brilliant. Uh, I believe that they, they are, there are certain experiences uh, in your life and, and probably certain uh, factors that might have contributed to you settling for uh, this particular topic and writing about this. 
What, what really inspired you to write this book? Of course, um, uh, this issue of writing always, uh, there is the personal in it. Mm -hmm. Then there is the, the scholarly aspect in it. Uh, the personal is always, because I've never worked anywhere except in, in academia. So I've been really grappling with this issue of, uh, uh, from my experience of being trained as a historian at the University of Zimbabwe, I've always noticed that uh, <clears throat> perhaps one of the major issues was uh, this issue that in the disciplinary base of knowledge, you will find that there is always this, this asymmetrical uh, relation in which uh, literatures from Europe are still privileged over other literatures. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's one. Two, the issue of methodology. Uh, in history, we're still privileging uh, more of, uh, of uh, written records, uh, the archival research, uh, and uh, it was only with the rise of African nationalism that uh, oral tradition also became recognized mm -hmm. as, as a methodology yeah, which can yeah. be used to, mm -hmm. to, to, to write uh, African history. And uh, you must remember the debates which were taking place at Ipatan, debates which were taking place at Dakar, mm -hmm. this idea of trying to dethrone imperial and colonial history. And they, I come from that experience, uh, that, that trajectory of thinking, whereby we will need perhaps to have epistemic freedom. And by epistemic freedom, I mean the ability of Africans to write as themselves, not as copycats of other people. Mm -hmm. To communicate ideas from where they are, to theorize and not import theory from somewhere. Yeah. To really build knowledge from where they are and from their own experiences. And that has not been easy because the school system itself, the school system meaning the primary, the secondary, as well as the university schooling systems, basically they are part of the global world system, which actually is meant to, it's, it's at the center, there is a line of sort of a civilizing mission whereby people are supposed to be moved away from their cultures, from their languages. Exactly, yeah. And they, and they, and they then adopt other cultures and other languages, and that is actually seen as being educated. So we're trying to move away from that and they underscore the issue of what we call locus of enunciation. Mm -hmm. Where do you think from and who, how do you think as who? And they taking into account that this black body can also produce legitimate and uh, globally relevant yeah. knowledge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, well, well, that's brilliant. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, before you wrote this work, um, there are conventional interpretations that were existing in the body of history. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed that Franz Fanon is one of, uh, is one of the uh, great writers who uh, right. engaged the, the discourse of post-coloniality uh, wrote very impressive books uh, yeah. and raised very interesting arguments. Yeah. So, uh, uh, considering the nature of of the literature that was in existence before you write this work, yeah, what particular contribution does your book make to that existing body of literature? Well, of course, um, the it's a it's a it's a bit of a complicated the uh, <clears throat> intervention in the sense that. Uh, by the time I joined the, the university, uh, the nationalist school was still very popular. Mm. The nationalist, the African nationalist school. Mm. Uh, we we really learned how to to think differently from the colonial way of thinking. And uh, by then, also, Marxism was uh, already beginning to lose its uh, its value. But it was still we still had some of our colleagues who were really committed to the Marxist agenda. Uh, what was not present where I studied was the issue of post-colonial thought. It was, it was not there. It might have been there in the English department, in, in the other department, but in history, it was, not a, it, was, it was not a major school, really. We, in the history department, we never did much of Fanon and the others. So I had to self-educate myself 
mm-hmm. after 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 graduating to reread mainly the literature from Africa to 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 and they, I actually nearly moved into the post-colonial theorizing mm-hmm. uh, 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 because of reading people like uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, people like Homi Baba and the others. We nearly really moved into the post-colonial, but I, I found that the post-colonial has its own limitations uh, compared to the decolonial. So for the past de- decade, I've been working with the decolonial school. Mm-hmm. The decolonial school actually contributes at many levels. First level where it contributes, unlike the post-colonial theorizing, mm-hmm. decoloniality does not, it starts almost 500 years of modern history. Mm-hmm. It goes as far back as 15th century with the dawn of modernity itself. Mm-hmm. And they, it begins to educate us that modernity cannot just be seen from one side as a positive phenomenon or a positive project. Modernity always had this underside. Mm-hmm. So by the time modernity unfolds, it fall, unfolds in this way that it deposits all the positives in Europe. But during the same time, what was it doing in Asia? What was it doing in the Caribbean? What was it doing in Africa? It was actually the time of enslavement. It was the time of, of colonial conquest, the time of apartheid under development and all that. Mm-hmm. So I come from that, 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 that experience of, uh, of, of the negative of modernity rather than the positive of modernity. But if a colleague from, say, London he will say modernity was good, Again, is correct because that's what they experienced. But mm-hmm. us who are on the other side, we experience the negative aspect of modernity. So my book really starts from that perspective of, uh, of documenting the, the, the negatives of modernity, including the, the fundamental question of racial hierarchization and the social classification of human species or human population in accordance with race. Mm-hmm. whereby the lighter skin you are the higher ontological density you have okay, the yeah. darker skin you are the lower ontological density you have yeah. and therefore that social classification and the racial hierarchization is not an innocent natural process it's actually a social engineering mm-hmm. of a particular project and they eat, by the very time that they hierarchize racially it therefore means that those who are put at the lowest echelons of that pyramidal human structure, they are said to have no knowledge. Mm-hmm. They are said to have no history. They are said to have no, even their languages, they are supposed really to move as fast as possible out of their own experiences into what is called civilization or out of primitivity into modernity, mm-hmm. if, if, if you like. So that's, that book brings all that and it also then deals with the question of, of epistemology. It builds from that background, mm-hmm. whereby what, 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 what happens to the people who for centuries or over 500 years, they've always been questioned as human beings. Their knowledge has been questioned. So what this book does is therefore to try to anchor some black, uh, and the black I'm using it in a very broad sense, Mm -hmm. to include Caribbean thinkers, to include Black American thinkers, to include Asian thinkers, to include non-whites in the true sense of the word. Okay, yeah. In in the true sense of the word. And uh, I try to prove that you can actually use them to see the world better. So this book is case studies uh, of uh, of, uh, leading African scholars, uh, uh, people like Al Mazuri, I have a chapter on him in that book. Mm-hmm. I have a chapter also focusing on the work of uh, of uh, of Mahmoud Mamdani. Mm-hmm. It is in that book, and uh, many others. So I I really tried to 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 think to think with the African thinkers, and they say, what type of work can we produce if we think with African thinkers, and mm-hmm. they we not that we therefore exclude the other thinkers, mm-hmm. but. Uh, 
uh, those who have been pushed to the margins. That was my, my concern, those who have been pushed to the margins. So if those who are pushed into the margins, you must also be careful because those who are pushed into the margins, there is also a patriarchal hierarchization there that you might end up really projecting only black men and uh, no women. So I tried by all means to also bring in black women into, into, into that debate. And uh, thematically, I therefore dealt with the question of the language which we use in coloniality because i was answering practical questions when people are always asking what is decolonization so the 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 first chapter after the introduction is the nomenclature of decolonization yeah, yeah, i noticed that okay, whereby i'm trying to say these are the debates about decolonization and that's why we say decolonization is very important now and that the world actually suffers from coloniality coloniality is all over it's not over Okay. And therefore, if you think that way, then you won't be surprised when you see what happened in, in where you are based in the U.S. when Floyd is being killed. Exactly. You know that as long as the world is governed by colonial matrices of power, then the black bodies are actually in danger mm -hmm. throughout. Then the, the, the other thematic area which I dealt with, which was inevitable to be ignored, is the question of the university. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the attempt to decolonize knowledge and the curriculum. Uh, I have a, a long chapter there, which, which, which interestingly, I went back into as far as earlier civilization, African civilizations like the Ethiopian or Axumite civilization uh, in Ethiopia, and they tried to understand what was the nature of knowledge and education in that before the colonization. And you know, Ethiopia, they are always saying Ethiopia was never colonized. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I, that was what attracted me to say, this country which never experienced the physical colonization, how was the, the education system arranged? Mm -hmm. So I depart from that and I pull it all the way up to the roads must fall and the fees must fall movements. Oh. And then I also deal specifically with the question of the roads must fall movements and I end the book with uh, dealing with the, a fundamental question which we'll need to deal with even more, the question of African futures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I see. Your, your book raises very, very critical uh, ideas, very critical themes. Uh, and I'm sure that provided the, the, the body of literature that existed uh, before, your, the, before your wake, uh, the contribution that you make, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, challenges conventional interpretations. And I'm sure that you know uh, some of these conventional interpretations that you directly challenge. Okay. Uh, what are some of these ones? There are many. Okay. There are many, there are many to, be, to, be, to, be, to be precise. The first one, which I, I think I've already spoken about, is this, who produces knowledge and who produces theory? Okay, yeah, yeah. I think that, 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 is an, that is an important question. But that question is, needs to be contextualized within what we call the uneven intellectual division of labor, mm -hmm. whereby most of the scholars who are located in the global south, in quotation marks, mm -hmm. are actually still stuck in hunting and gathering of raw data. A, doing field work and all those things. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they don't really produce theory in as much as Europe and North America do. Yes, yeah. So, so what, happen, what happens is that you will find that we gather a archival oral, but the processing is done still in Europe, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. North America, then consumed voraciously in, in Africa. So I tried to, to, to present people like Mamdani and the people like Al Mazuri, people like Achimafeche, and the many others as a theorist in themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they not only gather and they, they, they really also theorize, mm -hmm. but you cannot see it if you read it from the conventional uh, sense, whereby we always know that if you're an African scholar, you must actually have a surname, either you are a Foucauldian or you are a Gramscian or you are a Derridian or you are a Marxist. You can't be yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so that's that's one 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 major uh, a one major contribution which cuts across the whole book. And the second one is really about this question of decolonizing knowledge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a major theme which cuts across. What does it mean to decolonize knowledge? And why should we decolonize knowledge? Mm-hmm. And the book argues that the argues that knowledge actually creates reality. Mm-hmm. In other words, epistemology frames ontology. Therefore, what appears as politics, as economy, as society, is enacted epistemically first. Okay. So it's a it's a product of a particular knowledge which makes you have a particular view of economy, a particular view of politics, a particular view of society. Mm-hmm. And if this thesis is true, it therefore means if we want to change economy, if we want to change society, and we want to change politics, it all begins with knowledge production. We need to go back to knowledge. Wonderful, wonderful. So that that becomes really the starting point. And I I sometimes even give a example which which comes from the biblical uh, uh, understanding, whereby it says, in the beginning was the word. Okay, and the, yeah. and the, and the, and the word the, was with yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the word, as far as philosophers can tell us, they say it was logos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in decolonial thinking, we're therefore thinking that logos fundamentally means knowledge. Mm-hmm. That they got the knowledge, which then enabled him to envision the world Mm-hmm. And then in seven days, he invented it practically. Mm-hmm. And that resolves a major problem. It revo- resolves this problem of issue of instances and the naturalism. Mm-hmm. Whereby some people say, oh, you can't change this. It is always like this. You can't change it. This is always like this. So as for, us, as for me, I'm moving away from this issue of saying things are like that. And I'm saying there is knowledge which creates these things. Mm-hmm. And they, unless you can change knowledge so that you change the system, so that you change the institutions, so that you change even the behavior and the consciousness of a people. Take, for instance, the issue of um, us uh, as, as, as black academics always reading more voraciously literature from elsewhere than from what is around you. That mm-hmm. is a product of our training, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And it makes us then view the world in a particular way. So we need to, to do what we call reversing the gaze. Mm-hmm. It must not always the European gaze gazing into Africa. We need to gaze into the world from where we are. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. These, these, these are fundamentally philosophical questions. And the, the third issue which I bring in this book, there is this issue about um, connections and the solidarities. Mm-hmm. So my argument is that we have so much rich archive, decolonial archive or anti-colonial archive mm-hmm. in the Caribbean, in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, which when you read carefully, there is a long table in the book. When you read carefully, you can identify the thinkers, you can identify the issues, and you can see the commonalities mm-hmm. of, 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 of what is happening. So I'm, I'm always thinking about connections rather than these connections. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's an important challenge to what is called the paradigm of difference, mm-hmm. which is the central lit motif of, of, of coloniality. Mm-hmm. So it, it challenges things in, in different ways that way. And then the, the fourth, maybe the fourth important aspect, mm-hmm. if we agree with the premise of this book, that there is global coloniality, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then the question of how do we come out of that becomes very important. How do we come out of this entrapment in colonial matrices of power? Mm -hmm. And the issue is, I'm a product of what I'm trying to change. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm a product of the University of Zimbabwe. It It might be called the University of Zimbabwe. It is in Zimbabwe, but is it of Zimbabwe? Mm-hmm. That, is, that, is, that is the fundamental question which you need to understand. All these modern universities, they are part of a westernized mm-hmm. university system. Even if they are located in your village, they are not of that village. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, it is located there. 
you can give it the name and of a village, but you need to understand the epistemological uh, uh, what you call the scaffolding of yeah. the knowledge which is which which is being produced, and then you will realize that it is in here in, in terms of location, but in terms of what is taught is always exterior to the to, to where it is located. Mm. So we're trying by all means to say, therefore, I need to always investigate myself okay. as a product of a westernized university. Mm. And when I investigate myself, interrogate myself, I'm trying to move from miseducation to re-education. Mm. You remember that, that important book about the miseducation of the Negro? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that almost all of us suffer from that because we were never in charge of what we were taught, is it? Exactly, yeah. We, we, we were taught what, what we were taught. And uh, it is only now that you realize that perhaps what I was taught, this was miseducation. Exactly. And now, now that we have these positions, we have this, 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 this hindsight, mm -hmm. we can therefore rethink and uh, re-articulate our own consciousness so that we see the world different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do get the impression that um, these colonial matrices of power uh, can be redressed, uh, especially by this idea that you raise, that is epistemic freedom. When we reach a point at which we achieve epistemic freedom in our knowledge production, then we can get to redress those imbalances created by the colonial matrices of power. But yeah. now my question for you, and I, I see this because uh, the idea of epistemic free freedom cuts across uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a central tenet that cuts across many of your chapters. Mm -hmm. Why is the idea of epistemic freedom so much important for Africa in particular? Yeah, in fact, uh, my thinking was, uh, I read a lot about uh, the liberation struggles. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot about uh, liberation fighters, people like uh, Mugabe, people like uh, Krumah, Joshua Nkomo, Mandela, and uh, all these others. Mm -hmm. I read a lot about that. And uh, you might remember that uh, Nkwame Nkrumah is one who is credited for saying, seek ye the political kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, all other things will be added. Be added. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to shift that by saying, seek ye epistemic freedom first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because epistemic freedom empowers the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if the consciousness is enriched, therefore the quality of the political product mm -hmm. will also be, you, you, you won't then be, be uh, what you call, uh, uh, affected by colonial, what you call neo-colonialism. You can easily see it when yeah. it is coming mm -hmm. because your consciousness has been sharpened. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing the issue of epistemic freedom because why we think the way we are thinking here is that colonialism has its own epistemology of mm -hmm. domination. Mm -hmm. So it has its own epistemology of domination and I speak about that in terms of the cognitive empire. Mm -hmm. The empire which comes and invades the mental universe of a people mm -hmm. so that they forget their history, they forget their culture, they forget their language, and they adopt other people's languages. They adopt other people's cultures. They even uh, be comfortable with other people's histories rather than their own history because yeah, well, theirs yeah. is told that that was barbarism, mm -hmm. that was primitivity. Mm -hmm. And the colonialism was doing that for a purpose. It, in order to make us save what is dominating yes. Yeah, it, it, it is to deal with the consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's why I like Nguk Wationgo's idea that what colonialism does is that it removes the hard disk of previous knowledge and the memory and it downloads into the mind of his victim the soft way of European knowledge mm -hmm. and, and, and memory. And I must add, including colonial languages, which we are using between me and you now. Exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> It does that not because it's, a, it's, it's, it's fun. It is doing that in order to inscribe itself on space, on bodies, and on minds. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in order to deal with that question of 
a colonization of the mind, as Nguki will put it. Mm-hmm. You'll need to do a lot of work mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you need to go back to the epistemic question. Because even colonialism, before it established itself physically, it is first of all conceived epistemically, mm-hmm. I will argue. Mm-hmm. So even the decolonial project, you needed to conceive it epistemically before you unroll it practically. Mm-hmm. So that's why this issue of epistemic freedom is very important to me. And I, I see it that if we think maybe sequentially, mm-hmm. that you need epistemic freedom, then political freedom, then economic freedom. Mm-hmm. And I think we focused more on political freedom without dealing with these Pit, what, what Fanon will call pitfalls of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To the extent that even a liberator ends up suffering from the same pitfalls of consciousness mm-hmm. and it becomes a revolution which is its own children. Mm-hmm. And then how do we explain that unless we go back to the epistemic foundations of why is this person now thinking the way he is thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I always expected that a liberation struggle and a liberation movement must actually be a school of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what they did, which is wrong, bearing, using the example, say, of our own liberation struggle in Zimbabwe, Mm -hmm. is to have the commissars, of course. Commissars were supposed actually to be teaching epistemic freedom, but they were teaching discipline, compliance, and all these other things, Mm -hmm. except, and they were actually, instead of promoting critical liberator consciousness, they were actually making people who follow leaders blindly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that creates a problem. But the idea of the commissariat, it's an important one because you need to teach people to change their consciousness. Exactly. But to change it from what to what it becomes a major question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it becomes a major question. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm using the idea of the liberation struggle to say even the decolonization struggle we are engaged in is like a, is indeed a liberation struggle, mm. but we need to be careful that we are not actually indoctrinating people. Mm-hmm. We are actually making them to to be thinkers mm. on their own terms, mm. to be theorists on their own terms, to be producers of knowledge on their own terms, and to see the world from where they are and they contribute to knowledge like all other human beings. Mm-hmm. You know the example which which I can give, which is very 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 practical. If you go to a sociology department, yeah. uh, is it the University of Zimbabwe or anywhere, mm-hmm. you will find that there is what is called the canonical thinkers. Mm-hmm. The fathers. There is no mother. is always the fathers. Mm-hmm. So the fathers is uh, Emil Dakim, mm-hmm. Kali Marx, mm-hmm. Max Weber. Mm-hmm. And then you ask yourself a question. Who are these people? Mm-hmm. They are actually dead white men of Germany. Yeah, European philosophers. Yes, they are yeah. dead white men of Germany. But you can't do philosophy, I'm, I'm sorry, sociology without referring to those to people. Them. Yeah. Yes. And uh, does it mean, therefore, if sociology indeed is the study of the social questions and the social problems, mm-hmm. do you think there were no thinkers in Africa who also contributed to that type of thinking, who can actually constitute a canonical thought? Does it mean that? It doesn't mean that. It means the, the problem is that the person who is teaching sociology is also colonized mentally. Exactly. To believe that that's the system. Yeah. Yes. And they, to believe that to be a sociologist, you yeah. need to no. always know only these. Mm-hmm. And the interesting part is some of those people never even knew that they were sociologists. We made them sociologists <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that social problems of Europe mm-hmm. and the social problems of Africa, of Zimbabwe, they have their contextual uh, 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 terrain in which they emerge. Mm-hmm. So you can't generalize, but I think I was thinking in Bayreuth, mm-hmm. and I think he will solve the problem of Umbar, for yeah. instance. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 that's why thinking from where you are doesn't mean, therefore, you close yourself from the world. But it means I start from what I see into the world. Mm-hmm. I don't start from Europe into where I am. Where I am. Yeah. <laughs> that, that becomes a very problematic way of seeing the world. Then you want to see it. 
if you start that way, it is knowledge for concealment, mm -hmm. but we're talking about knowledge for revelation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Uh, Professor Gatiani, I see that uh, at the fundamental point, the fundamental fact that can help uh, the continent to achieve this idea of epistemic freedom from mm -hmm. what you write yeah. is fundamentally education and the way people are oriented in society, of course. But let us, let us look at formal education, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you believe that um, governments in our continent, in Africa, yeah. are doing a good job to try and uh, remodel their educational curriculums so yeah. that they can provide uh, a, a, a substantive decolonized education? And if so, uh, uh, if not, if not the case, uh, what must be done to achieve that? You see, the the whole decolonial struggle of the 21st century is to create a cutter of people who are decolonized mentally mm -hmm. in all aspects. You know, colonialism colonized almost everything. Every, yeah. Your past project, mm -hmm. your idea of what is beautiful your idea of truth, as the ethics, what you eat, it, it affected almost everything. Mm -hmm. So the decolonization uh, of the 21st century is a vast, must be a vast project mm -hmm. which attacks colonialism wherever it is hiding. Mm -hmm. It was very easy in the 20th century to know what we're fighting against because there was the physical empire which we all know were fighting against the Rhodesian regime and the white supremacy. Exactly. But now, coloniality and the colonialism mm -hmm. are hidden in institutions. Mm -hmm. And they are also carried by epistemology. Yeah. You can't see them using a naked eye, if I can use that example. Mm -hmm. it's it, will need, yeah, it's, it, it will need a critical consciousness to see where coloniality is hiding. Mm -hmm. And this therefore means that how do we expect these governments which exist today mm -hmm. to roll out an education for decolonization when the very people themselves who are in charge of the state are not decolonized? Secondly, let's not confuse anti-colonial thought with the decolonial thought. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So there is, there is, there is there are a lot of people who speak anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, but in their behavior, they behave like colonialists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, in their political practice, you can't see a difference between a colonialist or they are becoming even worse mm -hmm. than the colonialists in terms of disdain for black life. Mm -hmm. So it is these governments which I think this issue of decolonization of 20, 21st century, we need really to say, we need to re-educate all of us, not only those who are in the school, mm -hmm. even those in charge of the state, they need to change their consciousness. Mm -hmm. They need not to be lackeys of imperialism, if the Marxists were right, the lackeys of imperialism, mm -hmm. that you are in charge of your state, but you are, you are, you are actually, uh, what, what, what is the, you are, you are like a, a chief Half. Within a colonial administrative system. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're more like a puppet. Yeah. You, are, you are suppressing your own people for exactly. the purposes of capital to make profits, and then you repatriate the, the, the products into Europe. Mm -hmm. If you are doing that, you are exactly like a puppet mm -hmm. who actually sits in a power structure, saving not only your people, but for your people, you are a suppressor mm -hmm. of their interests, but you are also saving another court somewhere there. You are not actually taking your people serious. So the issue of, of decolonization it starts by me and you respecting black lives mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. Not only respecting them, loving them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the first place. It must not be, you don't reduce people to say the voters, for instance. Exactly. People are only voters. It means there are people who are there to vote you to power only. Mm -hmm. And if we are using voters, we have taken almost everything. They must be citizens, not voters, mm -hmm. who only you think about them after every five years when you want votes. All of that is a sign of that people still are stuck in colonial thought. Mm -hmm. 
whereby some people are subjects. They are those who are in the state apparatus who are citizens and they treat all the others as subjects and the subjects have no rights mm -hmm. in, the, in the true sense of the word. They have no entitlement mm -hmm. in the true sense of the word. And then a, liberator, a former liberation movement then turns around it wants people to account to it rather than it accounting to the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, 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 see, you, see, you see this problematic thinking. And all that is a product of colonial mentality, colonial mentalities, whereby you then confuse participating in a liberation strategy to be an entitlement to oppress, entitlement for, to, to, to loot, entitlement for impunity. Rather than I participated in, in the liberation struggle to liberate all the people. Then you turn it by right of liberating you, therefore I have all the right to the resources with my family or with my comrades. If you do that, then that's not decolonization, that's something else. Excellent. And then you need to name it, you need to name it that way. So in such a situation, when we are asking about can these governments therefore unroll another philosophy of education? One, two another knowledge which, which actually substantively empowers people. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, you and me having studied it in, in, in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. the issue of English being the main subject, if you fail English, you cannot get a job. Yeah, yeah. But there are no English people in Zimbabwe. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what the nonsense is that? Exactly, yeah. If you pass Shona, you pass the video, you pass to nothing. Yeah, yeah. The only important thing is mathematics and the English. And English, exactly. And then, you, and then you ask them, but why is this one given this sacred importance in a country where there are indigenous languages, hmm. where even the employers are no longer white? Hmm. Hmm. The employers are people who speak Shona, who speak the very So what, what is the English for? Hmm. And it is those type. It looks like those minor things. You can get at all level seven subjects, minus English, you are finished, you failed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you failed. So one of the major yeah. arguments which I, 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 I always present about our education system, particularly mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe, is that its success in the 80s, 90s, was the radical emulation of the British system rather than decolonization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We actually invested more in proving that we can manage this system and perform in it just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. But was that education meant for us? Or it was meant for something else? Well, yeah, for a purpose. Yeah, yeah it it's... was meant for something else. Mm -hmm. That's why you will find an ironic argument. Zimbabwe is uh, the most educated people, but people. they are the poorest in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, so, so it depends mm -hmm. now, it goes back to your argument about the formal education. Mm -hmm. The formal education for what purpose? Mm -hmm. We're not against formal education, it is important, but you need to repackage it so that it serves, it serves your, your interests. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I see. There's somebody, there's somebody who just recently tweeted that uh, 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 the, the idea of uh, higher literacy rates is actually an overrated thing because it doesn't it doesn't help a country to have uh, a significant number of its its population uh, mm. defined as having the ability to read and to write, but mm. without the ability to critically think okay. and to make sound judgment and, okay. and, and common sense, which 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 very much re uh, resonates with uh, these ideas that you raise. Well, now let's talk about the let's talk about the roads must fall uh, thing. Mm. I I I I want to talk about this in the context of trying to differentiate something that you raised uh, just recently. Mm. Um, the difference between un being anti-colonial and mm. being decolonial, right? Yeah. Uh, the, these movements of are trying to destroy colonial statues has become like something like a world, uh, yeah. a world uh, affair, a world thing that is happening all over the world in in the United States, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe. Recently, I am told the government wants to erect uh, a statue mm -hmm. of 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 the late Kuyanyanda yeah. in Harare. 
as a way of trying to commemorate African heroes and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also a movement that is saying these other statues of David Livingstone and Cecil Rhodes must fall. Mm -hmm. So these movements have been defined as radical movements that are somewhere in between anti-colonial and decolonial. So mm -hmm. does the Rhodes must fall fall in the category of anti-colonial or decolonial? The interesting part about uh, the roads must fall because I observed it closely because I was teaching in, uh, at the university in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was very clear on what they wanted. It was not really about the stage per se. Mm -hmm. The stage was just a sign of announcing the presence of the decolonial movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can tell that the, after the statue, the demands were escalated to the decolonization of the universities themselves in terms of their institutional cultures, in, the, in terms of their curriculum, in terms of their language. Mm -hmm. And the students who were spearheading that, th those movements, they were very clear that we are also picking up the labor question, mm -hmm. the exploitation of of the, the, the poor, the poor within the universities through outsourcing and all that. And they, they also spoke about eloquently about the need for African languages mm -hmm. to be brought into the university to inform teaching, research, and learning. Mm -hmm. So that way, I think it is more advanced than just being anti-colonial. Mm -hmm. And the, the interesting part, and the, indeed the paradigmatic importance, is that something which is that in the Southern African uh, uh, region of the world, it ends up influencing uh, students, at, uh, students and staff, even in Oxford, in the metropole. Yeah, that's true. That's true. To, also, to also think that way. And they were actually very happy now that it has even escalated in the wake of the death of George Floyd mm -hmm. into a planetary decolonial project, mm -hmm. which is no longer only operating in the global south, but even in the global north. Mm -hmm. There is movement of people saying, but we can't continue to have a statue of Carlstone, who was an enslaver, a statue of uh, Leopold King, Leopold uh, II of Belgium, who killed thousands of people in the TRC. So from Rose to Leopold to everyone, mm -hmm. it means a different consciousness mm -hmm. is developing at a planetary scale, mm -hmm. uh, which actually is the rethinking the colonial model of the world, if we use the words of James Blount, mm -hmm. the colonial model of the world, whereby the colonial model of the world has its own signatures on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the statues are actually part of those signatures. And they are not mere signatures, they are also part of claiming mm -hmm. space, naming places, mm -hmm. so that you, you claim ownership. Mm -hmm. So you can't then argue that, like the way they are arguing now, that they always, when you remove a statue, now you are destroying history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The argument, which they ignore is that, but this history which you are saying I'm destroying is written on top of my own history. Exactly. I actually deleted my own history. Yeah. And therefore, why are you worried about this one, which is this forged signature on top of my own signature? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, this type of thinking which decoloniality needs to bring so that at the end of the day, it's not a, just about destroying the statues. Mm -hmm. Statues actually constitute what I will call soft targets in a liberatory struggle. Mm -hmm. So all liberation struggles are known. They don't start by hitting bigger targets, hitting bigger targets. You start by what is, what is easier to attack mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you unroll a broader liberatory project. Yeah. Yeah. So the statues, people must not therefore think the decolonization will exhaust itself by attacking the statues only. Mm -hmm. Attacking statues is an announcement of a, a consciousness which is upon us, which is actually very angry about the colonizer's model of the world. Mm -hmm. And it is actually building into 
another model of the world whereby we will live. The world, the modern world is characterized by what we call planetary human entanglements. Mm -hmm. You are in the US, I am in Germany. I'm, we need to change that idea that Europe is for European, Africa is for what, mm -hmm. and all those things. Uh -huh. We need to, 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 to actually be up to scratch with the reality in the world. Mm -hmm. That where I am, I don't want to be actually treated as a second class citizen or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the, the, the decolonization project at, at a planetary scale is at. And they, it's important that we're now beginning to really, and the, the interesting part is the, is the cutting razor of the epistemic, yeah. Which, yeah. which is discussed in this book. Mm -hmm. Because that that is the 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 the, the departure point exactly. into other freedoms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you remember there is this this very good uh, sociologist and decolonial thinker, Bonaventura de Santos, who always say there can be no economic or social justice without cognitive justice. Mm -hmm. So you need to recognize the thinking, the aspiration, and the demands of all other peoples. Mm -hmm. as well as their world views in order to live uh, in a pluriverse rather than a universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for your responses, uh, Professor Katcheni. I'm, I'm very much happy to have heard you for this uh, episode. Yeah. I would yeah. like to invite you to like and follow the conversation on Facebook and yeah. as well as to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, okay. This is the place where I get to sit down with academics. We have written books academics who've written journal articles to discuss their arguments, uh, their evidence, their experiences in research, so as to conscientize the citizen. I believe that this could be also be the departure point for achieving epistemic freedom. Indeed, indeed is an important is an important aspect. And I thought by giving you the long interview, then I will qualify to 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 view the channel without paying anything. Wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sabelo Gatian Indrovu. Um, I want to invite our audiences to uh, read the book and access it online if they can. Uh, Epistemic Freedom in Africa, Deprovincialization and Decolonization. Thank you very much, Prof. Gatian. Have a good day. Sure, thank you. Wonderful, thank you.